Like a drama unfolding, the curtain was opening as an audience of angels was holding its breath. A census, a manger to travel worn strangers, the stage was finally set. Angels folded their wings at the throne worshiping as God whispered, I love you, my son. Then Jesus took off his crown and laying it down, said, Father, thy will be done. The time had now come for God's only son to be born as a light in a dark, lonely place. So he stepped from heaven's hall to Bethlehem's stall, where a star lit his newborn face. Then God called to Gabriel with gladness and tears. Play the trumpet, the horns, and the strings. Tell the shepherds and wise men and all who will hear. Tell all of the angels to sing. Fill the sky with your voices and sing. Joy. Joy to the world, praise to the King. Oh, let it ring. Joy, joy to the world, worship and sing. Jesus has come to bring joy, joy to the world, praise to the King. Oh, let it ring. Joy, joy to the world, worship and sing. Jesus has come to bring joy, joy to the world. Oh, let it ring. Joy, joy to the world. Jesus has come to bring joy, joy. has come to bring Jesus has come to bring Jesus has come to bring joy Christmas 2009. Our world seems especially lost tonight. Nations are engaged in bitter warfare. Disease and poverty are epidemic. The night is dark, the wind is cold, and people are in need of a savior. I wonder how many will fall asleep tonight, never realizing that he has already come. How many will celebrate this season without the hope of eternity? How many are still waiting for the promise of Christmas to come true? Christmas 1 AD, a small town in Judea called Bethlehem. Their world seems especially lost tonight. Nations are engaged in bitter warfare. Disease and poverty are epidemic. The night is dark, the wind is cold, and people are in need of a savior. How many will fall asleep tonight, never realizing that he is about to come? How many are still waiting for the promise of Christmas to come true? How many are waiting for a star, for hope, for their Messiah? How many? It's one more silent night, followed by one more hopeful day.
in Bethlehem. It's one more silent night. It's one more distant star. It's one more burning flame. It's one more silent night in Bethlehem. It's one more silent night. It was an unpredictable night in Bethlehem 2009 years ago. The sleepy country village had been inundated by a boisterous rabble of travelers, all clamoring for an evening's rest. They had been ordered to journey to their ancestral homes by Roman decree, and now every inn and shelter was filled with the noise of those wanting one more quiet night, especially an inn on the outskirts of town in the shadow of the Bethlehem Hills. It was run by a sociable, if somewhat stubborn, proprietress named Miriam. Sunset has come. This day has finally come to an end, and so have the kitchen's provisions. May Jehovah be praised. A godly woman, but one who speaks her mind. I said we've closed. And loudly. Good night, everyone. Thank you for your patronage and your haste in vacating the premises. Good night. Good night. Aaron, Sarah, help me clean up quickly, children. Yes, Father. You kids should have been in bed hours ago. Uh, Cassius, I said we've closed. You're the only one left. Surely you can call it a night. I still have a great many tabulations to finish. 
You may retire. I'll extinguish the lamps. And so it has been for the last five evenings in a row. You can thank Caesar Augustus for that. He orders a census of his personal dominion and then dispatches a mere handful of his paid chattel to count his subjects. Well, I trust Rome will compensate you for your labor. Yeah, I remember when I believed such. My friends tried to warn me of the bondage that awaited, but rather than stand up for my freedom, I bowed in submission. You know the irony of it? I used to think I was the lucky one because I'm still alive, but now I know the truth. My dead friends are a lot better off than I. They're free to be rest in peace while I toil my life away as mere property of the Roman Empire. Compensation? Yeah, Rome has given me nothing but grief and wretched servitude. Oh, they give me a mark and call me a servant of Rome. Yeah, all I am is a slave, as are the hordes of Judean commoners I register each day. We are all nothing more than property to be possessed and used. Cassius, listen to me. I wish you would talk with these hordes, as you call them, rather than merely count them. <laughs> Why? They're more lost than I am. No, you're wrong. They have, we have hope. The thousands that born to Bethlehem every day are of the lineage of David. We are a people who have been promised a Messiah, one who will deliver us from all oppression, even Rome's. Promised? By whom? Well, the promises are Jehovah's. The words have been inscribed by ancient, godly men, Micah, Daniel, Isaiah, prophets chosen by the Lord himself. I've said their words to myself a hundred times over. Those promises are what have kept each generation alive, waiting for the light that will surely come. Here. I have something you should see. Take this. I've written their words down from memory, so my children will remember and their children after them. Did you get this from the temple? No, this is merely an innkeeper's scrawl on torn parchment. I'll leave it with you tonight. Maybe you'll find time to glance at it in between your calculations. May it bring you some much-deserved rest. Well, good night, Cassius. Aaron, Sarah, it's time for bed. Yes, Mother. Arise. Shine, for thy light, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Very good. I didn't see you standing there, Aaron. Uh, do you know the rest of it? No. No. Do you believe it's true? No. I know it's true. Aaron! I need to go. Would you like me to fill the lamp out? No, no. I still have some reading to do. Good night. The word of the Lord that came to Micah. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, he that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting.
little I am. How can a city so small and forgotten give birth to someone so significant and powerful? The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. I dare that some days these words will come true? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Arise, shine, for thy light is come.
Jehovah, if you do exist, show me a light in this darkest of nights. The Bethlehem night held many questions and many prayers. The last guest had retired for the night, but a servant at the inn was still awake and at work. Mistress! Mistress Miriam! I must see you immediately! Hannah had been employed at the inn for many years. She was an orphan. Her parents had been killed by the Romans when she was still young. Miriam had taken her in, virtually raising her as her own. Hannah had always labored faithfully, but without joy. That is, until tonight. Tonight, she seemed overwhelmed by an unusual excitement. Miriam, where are you? I'm here, my child. I'm here. I can't believe you're still up. Now, I've just closed the inn. What's happened? We have a terrible situation at hand. The inn is full. <laughs> of course, as if I didn't know that. And there's this couple who's arrived, a kind man from Nazareth and his wife. So young and in such pain. In pain? What do you mean in pain? She's expecting. She's going to have a baby. Oh, a baby. Perhaps this very night. Mistress, you can't turn them away. There's nothing more important than the miracle of new life. No, of course not. We'll do everything we can for this young family. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, um, help Hannah gather some provisions and some blankets. But mother, we just gave our last few blankets away. We have nothing more. Well. You'll have to look in this box by the window. I think I have some older blankets in there. And gather anything else you can find that might give off some warmth. I will, right away. Good girl. Now, Hannah, don't worry. Everything will be okay. I know how to take care of a young family. Okay? All right, I'm going to go see to them. I'll be right back. Yes, ma'am. Sarah, did you find any blankets in the box? The old ones. And these long strips of cloth. Swaddling cloths. These must be from when your father died. Let's fold them up and take them. They'll keep the baby warm until morning. Hannah? Yes? Are you scared? Scared? No. I just feel badly about the circumstances this young family is going through. That's all. But there's going to be a baby born tonight. I thought it would make you happy. It does. It's just such a terrible way to be born. Why must everyone's life be so hard in these times? It was a night like this that I lost. Sarah, I just miss my own family. You know, I lost my parents when I wasn't much older than you. I know. Mother says you came the same year we lost father. I miss him so much, Hannah, and I never even knew him. I never even knew what he looked like. But my mother has always said that God will be my father, and my dad is in a better place. I know God will be your father too, Hannah. <laughs> How could I ever believe that? God led you to us so we could be your new family. No, the Bethlehem Road led me to you, and I'm glad of it. But God, he abandoned me a long time ago. <sighs> May Jehovah be praised. What more can happen tonight? This dear, sweet couple. And I've been forced to place them in the stable. The stable? Yes, the stable. It has a roof, and it's dry, and the straw will provide some warmth and comfort. Uh, look, I know it's no place to welcome a new child into this world, but Jehovah knows it was the best I could do. Sarah, were you able to find any blankets? Yes, Mother, but they're all old and torn. They'll have to do. Now, Hannah, I'm entrusting the inn to your care until I return. I can't imagine we'll have any more unexpected guests tonight. Oh, don't look so sad, dear. Everything will be okay. You'll see. Jehovah will take care of this young family. Now, I must hurry. A baby's coming, Hannah, a baby. Yes, a baby is coming. And God's here. I know it. He hasn't left us or you. Then why can't I hear his voice? Um... Maybe he's waiting for you to talk to him first. Sarah, I need you now. Coming, Mother. A baby's coming, Hannah. A baby. A baby. A baby's coming tonight. Tears. 
Tears are falling, hearts are breaking, how we need to hear from God. You've been promised, we've been waiting, welcome holy child, welcome holy child. that you don't mind our manger how i wish we would have known but long awaited holy stranger make yourself at home please make yourself at home Bring your peace into our violence, bid our hungry souls be filled. We're now breaking heaven's silence, welcome to our world, welcome to our world. fingers sent to heal us tender brow prepared for thorn tiny heart whose blood will save us unto us is born unto us is born around you breathe our air and walk our sun rob our sin and make us holy perfect son of God perfect son of God Welcome to our world. Welcome to our world. If you are listening, please protect this new life that has entered your world. May this child only know your joy. The inn was finally dark and still. It was well past midnight when several weary shepherds approached the back door. Ah, there's the inn. I thought I remembered one on the edge of town. Seth was a practical man, only concerned with matters of immediate necessity and comfort. This journey has ended. All I need now is a piece of warm bread and an even warmer blanket. But his brother Nathan saw things differently. Seth, we're almost there. We have just one more hill to climb. Why don't and we just finish tonight? Nathan's daughter, Rebecca, had her eyes fixed elsewhere. We can't. Stop. I know I hear something in the hill right over Bethlehem. Oh, no, that's just the howl of this bitter wind. All the more reason for us to bed down what's for left of this night. Uh, is there someone here who could provide us lodging? Hello? Hello? Seth, listen, we're already returning two days later than we planned. If we don't get these supplies to our companions by tonight, 
We might as well not even go at all. <laughs> That's the best idea you have had all night. <laughs> Rebecca, what are you looking at? I keep hearing something. It's like singing. A beautiful voice singing. You're a little old to believe in things that aren't real, that, that you can't see, aren't you? But I can hear singing. We can only believe in things that we can touch. Things that we can hold with our own two hands. Everything else is just wasted dreaming. I'm not dreaming, Vic. Don't you hear it? No, I don't. Good evening. Can oh, I help you? Yes, hello. I I'm sorry to bother you at such a late hour. My name is Seth. This is my brother and my niece. Uh, we, our families, tend sheep on the hill just beyond here. Uh, we've been traveling for several days, and we desire accommodations. Oh, no, there's not a single room available in this inn. I thought as much. Sorry to have bothered you. We'll be on our way. I'm truly sorry, sir. There are just so many people in Bethlehem for the census. I'm afraid the only place left in this inn is the kitchen. The kitchen? I'll take it. Suit yourself. <laughs> We're going. Come on, Rebecca. Look, Father, just beyond the crest of the hill. Do you see that light? Yeah, I see only stars. But they do seem a little brighter than usual tonight. I'm truly sorry, sir, but I'm not the proprietress at this inn. I only work here. Uh, my mistress is busy elsewhere. I don't mean to cause trouble. Uh, perhaps I could stay in the stable. No, the stable's occupied. Well, kitchen it is then. I hope I can bother you for a warm blanket. The wind is getting colder by the minute. Well, we don't have any blankets. Oh. But the kitchen is still warm from the oven. Just follow me. Are you sure you don't want to just come with us? Yes, Uncle Seth, please. No, really, I I'm fine. I'll catch up with you both in the morning after I've had a chance to rest. All right, suit yourself. Come along, Rebecca. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night.
It had finally happened. The centuries of hope and generations of prayers had come down to this one silent night, this one holy night, the God of eternity wrapped in the mortal flesh of a crying infant. Yet Bethlehem had not stirred. The angel's light had not broken through their dark night. The glorias were lost amid the bitter wind. But there was one song that shattered the silent night. It was the sound of new life, of birth, and the beginnings and endings of tomorrow. No wonder it was the children who heard it first. Children, oh, come one and all to Bethlehem's stable, to Bethlehem's stall, and see with rejoicing this glorious sight. Our Father in heaven has sent us this night.
angels had sung, the heavens rejoiced, and a star ignited the dark midnight sky. The Savior had come into the world, but the world took no notice. Who would believe that a kingdom would be built on the foundation of a stable? What sovereign would choose a manger for a throne and swaddling clothes for royal raiments? What Messiah would save his people by becoming one of them? And so this holy night remained a silent night. But in the sleepy town of Bethlehem, three young believers did recognize this king. One heard the promise of God's word. Another, the cry of new life. Another, an angel's song. But they could not keep this miracle to themselves. So Aaron, Sarah, and Rebekah left the light of the manger and walked into the night to awaken those who were in danger of missing the birth of the Savior. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, Looks like another silent night. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, a giant star lights up the sky. And while you're lying in the dark, there shines an everlasting light. For the king has left his throne and is sleeping in a manger tonight, tonight. My light has come. Yes, of course. The light is here. You must come with me. Whatever do you mean? Look, out there. Do you see the star shining upon the end? I don't believe it. Could it be? It seems to be shining on the stable. No, it's not the stable. It's who's in the stable the light is shining upon. Come and see. Dear, has something happened in the stable? Yes, something has happened in the stable. Hurry, Hannah, it's going to make you so happy. The baby is here. <sighs> I see, that's wonderful. But Hannah, the baby's father says, the baby's mother says the baby's father is Jehovah God. She told me she is a virgin, and angels came to her and told her to call the baby's name Jesus. He is more than a baby. He is our Savior. Can it be? Come on. Uncle Seth, wake up! Rebecca! Rebecca, what are you doing here? What's wrong? Something amazing has happened! When what? we joined the other shepherds, angels came to us! And they sang, and it was really amazing! Rebecca, if you have woken me because you're seeing things that aren't real... But, look, just please come with me! Please come to the stable! Our Messiah has come! What?
Oh, little town of Bethlehem Looks like another silent night. Hey, may I hold the precious child? So sweet, so tender. You really are him, aren't you? My whole life, I've hoped and I've prayed. But since my husband died, it has been so hard to remain faithful. I had almost given up hope. But here you are. Emmanuel, God with us. How could I have been so arrogant, so self-absorbed, so sightless? I once swore that I would only follow those in power, but my allegiance was to a barbaric imposter. The further I got from Rome, the closer I got to the truth. This child has changed my life. Imagine such authority amongst such simplicity. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little amongst the, the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come unto me, he that shall be called ruler of Israel, whose going forth is from old, from everlasting. From this day forth shall I serve but one king. Bethlehem was a prison to me, but it was a confinement of my own making. Grief imposes such a lonely exile. I was certain God had abandoned me, but I was the one who had fled. Who could imagine that I would find true life through this baby's birth. This child brings a new life to me, to my world, and to all the world. And to think, I almost missed his coming. <laughs> That's the trouble when you spend your life close to this earth. You tend to focus only on that which is right in front of you. It's easy to forget to look up. I always said that I believe in things that I could see, things that I could hold with my own two hands. But then I stood at the manger, and I saw him, so fragile, so tiny, just a baby, yet so much more. He was God in the flesh. He is our promised Messiah. He is the King of all Israel. And he is my savior. Eternity stepped into time and drew immortal breath. This mystery so clearly seen. The world could not forget that in the town of Bethlehem, in the most unlikely place, God the Father wore a child's face. There's something in the heart of God, so purely meek and mild. Find 
finds its best expression in the longings of a child. For every heart is hungry to be found and loved and known by someone who How we thank God tonight for Bethlehem and for what took place there. And we thank God for the truth tonight that in Bethlehem, God gave to us His greatest gift. He gave to us His only begotten Son. The Bible speaks of it very clearly in John chapter 1 and verse 14. And there the Lord describes to us what happened on that first Christmas night. The Bible says, and the Word was made flesh. And I want you to think of that for a moment. The Word, the Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is the eternal living Word, and that eternal Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He who was from everlasting, false teachers and cults of this day, will say that Jesus Christ began his existence in Bethlehem's manger. But the miracle of this Christmas 
is the fact that he who is eternal became man, took the form of man in order that we might behold him. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No greater gift was ever given to you, to me, than this gift from God, His everlasting Son. Now, a lot of times we focus on gifts at this time of year. I saw my wife before the service, and I said, have we gotten the right gift for the girls, and are we, catch, are we catching up on our Christmas shopping, and, and uh, she's doing real well in that department, and, and we do think about those things. I heard about a little boy that ran to his mother in the kitchen, and he said, Mom, we better tell Santa Claus to forget the train set I ordered. I just found one on the top of Dad's closet shelf. <laughs> it's amazing how our kids do a good job of inspecting every room at this time of year. But God's gift was His only begotten Son. And I love what John 1.14 says, And we beheld His glory. The apostles were eyewitnesses of Christ and eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ and they beheld His glory. They looked very intently upon Him. They contemplated Him. John and Peter and James saw the unveiling of His glory at the Mount of Transfiguration and they were amazed at what they saw. They saw His divine nature. They saw His ability to heal. They saw his ability to know even what men were thinking. And they beheld his glory. And I hope for a few moments tonight you, like I have done, took some time to behold the glory of God and to recognize that he can still change lives. To take time tonight to think about this great gift, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the greatest gift of all because... It is a gift from God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. How many of you believe with me tonight that God the Father loves His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? And yet He loved you and He loved me. He loves Lancaster and Palmdale and the Antelope Valley. He loves America. He loves all the countries of this world, all of the people of the world, for God so loved the world that He gave. And He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus Christ was deity wrapped in humanity, the Son of God given as a gift from God. And it's hard to comprehend how God loved His Son and loves His Son, the Lord Jesus. The little baby a moment ago up here, in case you're wondering, is our first grandson. He was born a few weeks ago. And uh, we're happy about that. His name is Camden Matthew Mord, and Danielle and Peter uh, brought him into our lives, uh, and we're so thankful for him. And a little while ago, he was crying up here. I don't like to hear my grandson cry. <laughs> Bothers me. It really does. It breaks my heart. And. Uh, and when he, when he cries at our house, I always say, Danielle, do something. <laughs> Change him, feed him, burp him. I mean, take, take care of him. I don't want to hear him cry. And uh, it kind of hurts your heart to hear a little baby cry. But I wonder what God felt like when he heard his son cry at Calvary. I wonder what it was like when the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom I wonder what it was like when the skies were darkened and the Father could no longer see His Son, for His Son was bearing my sin and your sin. I wonder what it was like for God the Father to love with that kind of love. You see, that's how much God loves you, my friend. And why so many men today have no room in the end for Jesus is beyond me. Why they would worship the rocks and the stars and the whales and the creation, when they could worship the Creator God, is so hard to understand. Jesus Christ is God's gift to you and to me. This gift is a gift from God. And this gift is a gift for everyone. It doesn't matter where you were born or the color of your skin. 
It doesn't matter where you came from or how you got here. God loves you and wants you to be saved. The Bible says in John 1 and verse 12, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Has there ever been a time in your life when you believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you put your complete faith in Him to be your Savior? Now, I know a lot of people that have religion. Uh, they have joined a church. They have been baptized in water or sprinkled by water. They receive a wafer at church or a cup. And they've done a lot of religious things. But when you ask them, do you know for sure that you have a relationship with God? And do you know for sure that when you die, you'll spend eternity in heaven? Many of those people who have religion have said to me, I hope so. I, I think so. But in reality, they are not sure that they have ever truly received the gift of God. They are not sure in their heart that they have a personal, everlasting relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And my friend, all of us need this. All of us need to receive the gift of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Frankly, if I was not a sinner, then I would not need a Savior. And if you were not a sinner, then you would not need a Savior. But the Bible sets the record straight when it says, For all have sinned. Every pastor, every priest, the Pope, the Dalai Lama, everyone on this earth is a sinner who comes short of the glory of God. And that is why everyone needs a Savior. Everyone needs the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. And as many as will receive Him, the Bible says, to them gives He the power to become the Son of God. This gift that we speak about tonight is a gift from God, and it's a gift for all who will believe. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then I want to say finally tonight, it is a gift of grace. It's a gift of grace. It's, it's frankly so undeserved that God would love us in this way. And the longer I live, the more I realize how undeserving I am and how undeserving the human race is of this love. That God would love sinners like us is an amazing thought indeed. God, by His grace, offers salvation to all who believe. You know, you might go to your wife this Christmas or to a friend and you might say, now, I'll tell you what, I bought a nice gift for you and uh, it's quite, quite nice indeed. And I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll cook me a wonderful meal at Christmas Day, if you'll rub my back, if you will take some time to uh, massage my shoulders and if you will uh, bring me the paper and if you will turn the channels for me and if you'll do everything I ask today at the end of the day then I will give you the gift that I purchased for you. After your wife hits you with the skillet over the head <laughs> you will realize that asking someone to earn the gift negates the fact that it was a gift. You don't earn a gift a gift is something given freely. And so many churches and religions tonight are simply saying, you want to go to heaven? You want a relationship with Jesus? Then you've got to do this, 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 and this in order to have it. My friend, that is exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches about salvation. Salvation is not something I earn because I am so good. Salvation is something I receive because God is so gracious. And so it is a gift of grace. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And if you're saved tonight, you would be the first to admit you don't deserve it. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You say, well, Pastor Chapel, I'm going to heaven because I keep the seven sacraments. And I'm going to heaven because I have a Sunday school pin from my Baptist church. From here to the bottom of my toes, I have been a very good attender at my church. And all these things could be said. But the Bible says it's not because of what you do, it's because of what Jesus did. And we're here tonight to celebrate what he did. He humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
He humbled himself in the way he came in Bethlehem's manger. He humbled himself in the way he lived and in the way he served for 33 and a half years. He was tempted in every way to sin, and yet he never sinned. And when he died on that cross and shed his blood, he shed the blood of the perfect Son of God. It was the only atonement that would please God the Father. It was the only way that we could have our sins forgiven. It is a gift of grace. A friend of mine for many years was a lifeguard. He trained lifeguards, and he told me something one time I have never forgotten. He said, the hardest people to save are the people who are trying to save themselves. And he said, one of the things we always have to say when we swim out to someone in danger, we have to tell them to relax and to let us help them. And I find that to be true as a pastor. The hardest people to see saved are the people who are trying to save themselves. People who think that because of their religious pedigree, because of what they do, because they're better than their neighbor, they're going to get to heaven. Friend, we can't save ourselves. We must put our faith in Jesus Christ alone. It is a gift. It is a gift from God. It is a gift for all. It is a gift of grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here's the question. Have you ever personally received that gift of grace? Has there ever been a time in your life when you said to the Lord Jesus, Lord, I acknowledge to you that I am a sinner. I do fall short. I try, but I know I'll never measure to your righteous standard. And so, Lord, I call unto you, the perfect Son of God, and I ask you to come into my life and save me, forgive me, and bring me into your kingdom eternally by your grace. My friend, when you call to the Lord in that manner, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if a man will confess with his mouth and believe in his heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Someone says, well, I don't, I, I don't really understand all these terms, saved, born again, all this stuff. Well, let me just tell you something, friend. You don't have to be a theologian to receive salvation. You simply have to turn to Jesus Christ and Him alone and trust Him to forgive your sin and to bring you to heaven someday. And if you've never done that, then why don't you receive that gift tonight? Why don't you, by faith tonight, receive the gracious gift of God and say, Lord Jesus, I call to you as a sinful man or sinful woman. I ask you to come into my heart, forgive my sin, and give me a home in heaven with you someday. And God, by His grace, like he did for me on April the 5th, 1972, will come into your life and he will save you and he will keep you until he calls you home. Let's have a word of prayer together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the greatest gift of all, the gift of your son. How you love your son and how it must have hurt your heart to turn from your son as he bore our sins on the cross of Calvary. But tonight we pause in this musical presentation to thank you for that love, to thank you that you gave so generously. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that though you could have called 10,000 angels and said, take me away from this cross, that you willingly suffered there for our sins and that you rose again the third day for our justification. Please, Lord, let that be a personal, relevant truth to many for the very first time tonight. May many tonight receive that gift. May there be no one who would say, I have no room in my heart for Jesus Christ. I would ask tonight that our heads remain bowed and our eyes closed for just a moment. In just a moment, we'll hear the final portion of this wonderful musical presentation. But right now is a moment to consider your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I wonder how many in this room can say, Pastor Chapel, there was a time in my life when I did realize that I fell short. I couldn't turn over another new leaf. I couldn't buy my way into heaven. I, I couldn't be good enough. And I realized it wasn't up to me. It was all because of Jesus. And there was a day in my life when as a sinner, I cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, I do confess to you that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to come into my life and be my Savior. And from that day until this, you have known that Christ is your Savior and that heaven would be your home. And if that's 
the gist of your testimony tonight. I wonder so I know who I'm talking to. If you just say, that's my testimony, and I'm glad I am saved. I wonder if you'd lift your hand tonight as a testimony just to help me out a little bit. All right, wonderful. God bless you. you may put your hands down. We'll not embarrass anyone tonight, and we certainly uh, are not going to take much more time, but I want to give you an opportunity who did not raise your hand to settle that issue. And those of you that did not raise your hand, I want you just to think with me for a moment about the fact that God has so simply and graciously provided salvation. And if you are here in this room tonight and you believe that you are a sinner, that you fall short of God's grace and God's glory, and you say, I know I'm a sinner, and you believe that Jesus Christ was not just some teacher in human history, but that he was virgin born miraculously as the Son of God, and that he did die on the cross and shed blood to cover your sin, then I would encourage you in this moment to say a prayer to the Lord, something like this. Dear Lord, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I believe that you died for my sin. I ask you now to come into my life. Forgive me. Be my Savior and my Lord. I trust you, Lord, to take me to heaven for all of eternity. And I ask this based upon your grace. Something simple, once again. Dear Lord, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I ask you now to come into my heart and be my Savior. Forgive my sin. Be my Lord. And take me, Lord, to heaven someday by your grace. Now, if you have just prayed that prayer, and if you meant it, then there is a loving God in heaven who heard the prayer of your heart and promises to save your soul. And I wonder right now in this room, if you just prayed that prayer and said, Lord, I want to receive that gift of salvation, if you would just let me pray for you and rejoice with you. And the way you can do that is just right now by simply lifting up your hand and saying, Pastor Chapel, I prayed that just now. I'm not ashamed that I did, and I'm glad that I did. Would you lift your hand right now? Lift it up in this auditorium and just hold it there for a moment. I want to see who I'm talking to and, and see who prayed that prayer all over the auditorium. How about up in the balcony? All right, wonderful. I see a few in the balcony. God bless you on the far right and the far left. You may put your hands down. Before I pray, I wonder if there's a Christian here tonight. You've heard all of this before. But the fact of the matter is you're not living for the Lord. Maybe you came here for a friend or for another reason. But you've not been living your life for the one who died for you. And this Christmas season, you ought to say, Lord, I want to rededicate my life to serve you. Many people in America serve many causes, but there is no greater cause than the cause of Jesus Christ. And I wonder if the Lord isn't speaking to some Christian tonight about serving Him more effectively. And I pray that you'll surrender your heart to Him in that area. Our Father in Heaven, I pray and thank you just now for the tremendous way that you have spoken to hearts in this service. You have spoken to mine, and you have reminded me of your love and how we thank you for it. And I thank you for those who prayed tonight to receive Christ as their Savior. And, oh, Lord, we ask tonight that they would begin to grow in the faith, that they would be established by your word. Bless the final moments of this service. Help those who are rededicating their lives or perhaps making other decisions. May tonight's service be for them a turning point. And may there be an eternal difference made, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. And they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light shined. Lift up thine eyes round about and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else.
For the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Join with us in singing.
What a wonderful evening. Would you thank Brother Guy, the orchestra, the choir? Would you stand, orchestra? Let's all stand together. We're going to lift our voices again and sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Bear with us, our guests, for just another moment or two. We have a few announcements and one more uh, item of business to take care of for our church family. Joy to the world. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature Joy to the earth, joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat. Wonderful choir and Brother John Guy, a great job on his first uh, musical and orchestra and all involved. Thank you for exalting the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. I'm going to ask our ushers to come as we prepare for our offering tonight just before we're dismissed. And if you are a guest, we thank you again for coming. And we did not invite you to make you feel obligated to an offering. But this is our normal Sunday night service. And we're going to take care of a few matters before we're dismissed. I believe we have some young people to sing as well during this offering. And uh, what a privilege it is during this season to give to the Lord and to express our thanksgiving to Him for all that He has done. Let's pray and ask Him to bless this offering right now. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving so bountifully. Your son, this night, all of the blessings that we enjoy are from you, and we thank you. And we pray tonight, Lord, that you would take this offering and that you would use it so that others, both here in the Antelope Valley and around the world, may hear the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come and that he does save. And Lord, we pray that you would Help us as we continue to serve you in these upcoming days. Use our lives and this church for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
is a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men, and the bells are ringing. Shall we stand together, please? Thank you, young people. Those young people were freshmen here at West Coast Baptist College this semester, and we are delighted to see God work in the hearts of young people on this campus every single day, and we pray that God will use them greatly in their lives and in their ministries. Just a couple of announcements before we are dismissed tonight. First of all, we do want to thank everybody out in the lobby tonight. We had lots and lots of chairs set up out there, and uh, we're working on expanding our driveways and expanding the walls of this room and other areas of this campus, and uh, thank you for your patience. We had a full house last night and tonight, and it's a good thing to be with a whole bunch of Christians anyways in a packed house, amen? And I'm so glad that we've had this time together tonight, but thank you for your patience, and I do want to ask you to be patient on the way out, and let me encourage many of you uh, to use the driveway that is out uh, on the east side of the campus going out onto Lancaster Boulevard. This time next year, Lord willing, we'll have two lanes in and two lanes out on the middle of our property, but right now we have just the two driveways, and so you can use the one on the east side. Some of you may want to turn right and go up to 50th and then go on to Palmdale or other places from there. Others can go to Lancaster Boulevard and turn left and go, go to the west, or of course you can take the main driveway out this side and to go on out towards Avenue J. Be careful around the parking lot with all the children. And we do encourage you to take a few minutes and just enjoy the fellowship and enjoy the time on the campus. The Revels building is open, the coffee shops, uh, the bookstore, all of this is available. Take your time and uh, let others maybe get out ahead of you as uh, you enjoy uh, the atmosphere and the fellowship tonight. Let me just say a couple of things by way of practical announcements. Tomorrow morning, Lancaster Baptist School will begin at 9 a.m. Please make a note of that. The teen Christmas parties will take place tomorrow night, and uh, you uh, will meet here. Brother Schmidt, is that right, for the teenagers? And uh, they'll have a great time tomorrow night. This Wednesday night, the Lancaster Baptist School Christmas program will be presented, and uh, we'll have a wonderful night. Everyone, of course, is welcome. And uh, then let me remind you to read through the bulletin and plan to participate in all of the upcoming activities as we look forward to serving the Lord together this month. If you are a first-time guest or you're here for maybe the second time at Lancaster Baptist, don't forget that table out in the lobby. We'd like to give you a hardback edition of our book, A Daily Word, a daily devotional for you every day in your new year as our gift to say thank you for being with us tonight. It's been a wonderful time, and we thank you for coming tonight. I'm going to ask uh, our associate pastor, Brother Kerry Schmidt, to dismiss us in prayer. Many of us will be out in the back if we can help you with any questions, especially questions about what it truly means to be a Christian. You just let us know. We'd love to talk with you about that tonight. Brother Schmidt. Father, we thank you for a wonderful evening, for the work of so many people. We thank you for our guests tonight and that they would come and enjoy this with us is, is why we present this. We, we pray that you were pleased. We pray that hearts were touched and encouraged and changed. And bless as we go our ways, give everybody in this room an encouraging and a Christ-centered Christmas. 
and a wonderful new year. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.